coming up on this week's episode of Tech Snap. We can't contain our excitement as we dive deep into the world of jails, zones, and so-called Linux containers. Dan shares his years of experience using the original bad boy of containers, FreeBSD Jails. I explain C groups, namespaces, and all the other gobbledygook that goes into creating containers on Linux. Plus, we discuss workflows, similarities, differences, and what might make sense for you. And of course, we've got your fantastic feedback, a rip roaring roundup, and so much more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Welcome to TechSnap, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems, network, and administration podcast. This is episode 345 for November 17th, 2017. This episode is streamed live and is brought to you by our three most excellent sponsors, DigitalOcean, Ting, and IX Systems. My name is Wes, and joining me this week is the master of all things BSD, it's Dan. Welcome, Dan. Hello. Wonderful to see you again. How are you doing today? I'm I'm doing well. It's Friday. Oh, yes, well, it is Friday. It, it's Friday for us, yes. Yeah, you can watch this yeah. any old day that you want. That's the beauty of the internet and of podcasts. But for us, it's Friday, and that's a wonderful it's Friday. thing. We've got lots of fun things to talk about today. But before we do that, yeah, we do. is there anything new do. over there in your wonderful bat cave of servers um, and tapes? I went to the office last week, and one of the things that they had sitting around was a very different style keyboard. Oh, and I've started using guy. this. So so I've been using this for nearly a week now. Well, all of this week I've used it. And it's very it's very sculpted to the hands, but you have to get used to doing backspace and delete with the left thumb and enter and space with the right thumb. And because of that, I'm I'm hitting enter prematurely a lot. Oh. So I'm getting used to that. But I'm going to give it a full two weeks and see how that goes. That's a pretty good testing um, period, I think. Gives your hands some time to adjust your, your rhythms and patterns. And it's painfully slow <laughs> to get at the beginning. It's very slow. Things I used to be able to blather out really quickly, I couldn't. And then the other thing I got twisting over here is because work upgraded my laptop, I felt that I had to upgrade my home laptop because it was so much better, but I bought myself a new um, MacBook Pro. Oh, um, look at you. And that is now my main personal bot, um, laptop over there. Uh, I'm Skyping to you over my uh, the MacBook Air that, I, that I've had for a couple of years. And um, I quite like both for different reasons. Like, the, the the pro has a some people are complaining about the keyboard but i really like the keyboard on the pro mm. despite the fact that i'm using this keyboard over here right but you don't mind it if you have to sit down with the pro on the couch or whatever no it works no. fine not at all and the, the the lack of the escape key now being as part of the touchpad it, uh, touch bar mm -hmm. touch bar right i don't mind that and, and one thing i didn't know is that the touch bar is context sensitive so depending on what application you're in yeah. What's displayed on the touch bar changes. I know a lot of people for example, have been enjoying that for like video editing or other things so you can scrub across your clips. Yeah. And if I'm in terminal, I type something up. If I press the man page button, I get the man page for that word. Oh. That's and that's fun. very handy. Yeah, that's yeah, great. That's very handy. Huh. And then if you look behind me, the rack is sort of all torn apart. Oh gosh, what happened? Um, nothing, but I've realized that I have to rearrange the rack. I've got some of my power distribution units around the side, and I, I like that for a while, until you have to remove stuff that's hidden by the power distribution unit. So if okay, there's a rail be a behind it, you can't, you can't get to it. Um, it. Not all my rails are the easy on, easy off. You actually have to use a screwdriver. So what I've decided is that I finally decided to figure out, do I want the R610 or do I want the R710 that I've got here? The R, the Dell R610 is a 1U and the 710 is a 2U. Okay. Uh, and I hooked them both up, listened to them, and the 710 is quieter. 
So I'm going to be using that as a Poudrier build server. Mm. Uh, it's going to access the tape library, and I'm going to move all my monitoring onto that box. Awesome. And I'm going to order two L5640 chips. You can get them for about 20 bucks each, maybe, maybe 15 um, What are those? Because they're lower, lower power. Uh, I think I might be able to get that running at maybe 120, 130 watts. Oh, yeah, okay. Which, which is about 7 to $10 a month, I think, to run. No problem. And so I think I'll just I'll just do that. That's exciting! I, wow, that's a lot of changes up in, up in, up in your little office there. Yeah. So now I'm waiting for hardware. I'm, I'm waiting for SSDs, which have been delayed. They were supposed to be here yesterday. Uh, um, IC Doc makes a very nice 3.2 to 2.5 adapter, so you can put an SSD in a full width oh, slot drive yeah. drive K. Those are really handy. They're very nice. I've re they're they're made of plastic, but they're they're solid. It sounds sort of kind. It does. It does. But I know what you mean. I mean, if you do a good job with the fab, then uh, yeah, yes. not a problem. Yes, and I've got them in use in some of the drive bays on the other servers. So instead of running six SAS drives in the R710, I'm going to run six SSDs. And it should be a lot quieter, and it should give me about uh, one terabyte of space. Awesome. Fast space, too. Fast space, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to awesome. use that as a Poudreur build server oh, and as a sense. Bacula uh, storage daemon because it's going to have the LTO4 tape library attached to it. Mm. Wow. I'm impressed. So, yeah, that's why it's a mess. And it's probably going to stay a mess for another two weeks until everything gets put back together again. Yeah, I know how that stage goes where you're like, well, okay, I have to tear everything apart before I yes. can make it pretty again. And there's and just nothing you can do. Yeah, there's tripping hazards all over here. Don't let OSHA look at my home office. <laughs> yeah, we won't, we won't say anything. Audience, you don't say anything either. All right, please. <laughs> yeah, we've got secrets here on the Techstamp program. Very important secrets. All right, well, uh, anything else, or should we jump into the main topic today? I think that's about it. Okay. I don't say, there's nothing else new apart yeah, from that. that. That's a lot of stuff. That's Holy a crap. lot of stuff, yes, absolutely. You've done your due diligence, sir. I've tried. And this week, we're going deep into jails and containers. That's our main point. That's right. So it seems only fair uh, that since, you know, jails came first, historically, uh, that maybe if you want to talk us through a little bit about, like, you know, if, if people aren't familiar, maybe they've used containers, maybe they haven't used anything, maybe not even virtualization. What are jails? What's, what are the, what's the point? And how do you interact with them? I went and found Paul Henning Camp's original blog post on jails. Oh, great. And he, he is best known for bringing jails to FreeBSD. Um, now, some people may think of jails as virtualization, but it's not really virtualization when you think of virtualized environments. And Paul talks about virtualization is nothing new. And depending on how you define virtualization, one can point to the earliest of time-sharing systems as the origin of virtualization. And it was the IBM 360, which is, I don't know when he wrote this, but um, he's saying that that was been around for at least 50 years. And I remember playing with an IBM 360 when I was a teenager. So they weren't the latest and greatest machines, but he, the at the heart of jails is an operation called CH root, which is change root. And that was invented at CSRG UC Berkeley. And it was found, it was created by Bill Joy as a quick hack to do release engineering work on the BSD operating system without needing a dedicated computer just for that one task. And really all it does is it it makes the implicit anchor point of the root directory an explicit anchor point which can be changed on a per-process basis. 
so root it, the root directory is not the same for every process. You can change the root directory of any process. And people may be familiar with this uh, for FTPD because you used to right. let people FTP to something, but the root directory of that object was not the root directory of the server, but the root directory of what you ch rooted FTPD to be. And I also use point, that. Yeah. yeah. And I also use that feature on rsync. When I'm rsyncing stuff from a remote system to a local system, there's an SSH connection, which is by passphraseless SSH key. Mm -hmm. And in order to tightly restrict that, I use the tool rrsync, which well, does a, a ch one. root. Yeah. It's very nice. You put it in in your authorized keys file as a command, and it'll do a ch root to whatever directory you supply, and then that's the only thing that you can rsync from. It can also set your rsync to be read only, so that you can only download stuff. You can't upload stuff. Um, and I've been, I use that for backing up databases over rsync, and I use it for copying configuration files and stuff like that. But it's all based around ch root. Um, now, there are ways for a process to escape ch root, in particular the dot dot entries, but this is not exactly a secret back then. Um, but it's more or less the beginnings uh, of how jails came about. Right. Now, it, it, it was that first sort of change from just, you know, regular Unix user style permissions in terms of, well, mm -hmm. you have multiple people running on this box. They can all see the same thing. Maybe mm -hmm. they don't have the right, you know, they can't access mm -hmm. everything or change it. And then now with, with Chirrut, then suddenly you're suddenly, your world is a little bit different than what you had before. Yep. And w w what's interesting is that a friend of Paul, of Paul Henning Camps, contacted him to say, Hey, listen, I've got these customers in, a, in my web hotel that need different versions of Apache, MySQL, and Perl. And so basically, he, he was running different machines, each one of which was nearly idle just for these different software loads. And so Paul Henning thought, well, CH Root might be able to do this to create lightweight virtual machines. And he said that, okay, Derek, you fund this work. And a year, you'll have it for a year, exclusive use, and then we'll put it into FreeBSD. And so there were five things that he developed. Making sure that you can't escape the CH root or jail, restricting process visibility, deciding what root can and cannot do in the jail, and teach certain device drivers about the jail, and give each jail its own IP number. And... This was back uh, in 90, I'm going to guess it was 97 when he was do, doing this because he had it for a year. And then in April 1999, it was committed into FreeBSD. So how many years ago is that? 17, 18? 18 or so. 18 years ago. So jails aren't new. They're, they're legal in most states now. They can drink. Well, no, drinking age down here is is not 21 usually, isn't it? Yeah, okay. So, But in Canada, they can drink just about anywhere. So there, there were some other things that came, came around. There, there was some, there's some very interesting reading in this article. I'm going to read it. We'll have it in the show notes. But just the history of it. And I only read this maybe a year or two ago was my first reading of this. But it's very good to, to see how it started. <laughs> so, what do I use jails for? Um, d different things. Like, I, I want to do um, uh, regression testing of Bacula, and I want to do it with different versions of Postgres and different versions of MySQL. And rather than install multiple versions of the same database server in one host, I just create seven different jails all identical except for the different database sitting behind it and run the exact same regression test on each one and none of them interfere with each other. I can upgrade them independently 
And when you're in the jail, it looks exactly like a full FreeBSD host. It's it's not easy to to for the for basic apps to encounter problems in terms of oh this isn't a jail you can't do that it's just basically it looks like a full host to you and most people would not be able to tell the difference now someone's going to say well no there are big differences between being in a jail and being on a on a, on a raw iron host and i said yeah there are but that's not the point Basically, you install software, you run software, it's just like running on the host, except you're not. And I like that. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. So, is is that a basic sort of intro? Yeah, yeah, you know, I think I think so. Um, how do you interact with with jails? What, you know, when you need to go spin up a new one, what do you reach for? Are there tools built into the operating system? Are there user land helper tools that that you're going to use to do that? Um, you know, because before, like, you know, we talked a little bit about Chiroot. Maybe people have used Chiroot on the command line, uh, and that wasn't enough. So I want to take it to the next level. I want to get a jail going. Maybe I've just installed a new free BSD host, um, perhaps on one of our sponsors <laughs> even, and, and, and I want to get that started. How do I... How do I get jails? Are there simple things I can do? Do I have to go really complex? Do I have to have yeah. ZFS? Mm -hmm. um, what's nice about ZFS is you can give each jail its own file system, and it's totally independent, and you can adjust it for the needs of that individual jail. Um, for example, this jail might need really fast data storage, so you put it, say, on an SSD or... The, the, this jail need needs a lot of very small files, so you may change the record size. Or this jail is going to be running a database, so you can adjust. You, you can cater for that as well. But you don't need jail. You don't need ZFS in order to run jails. But there are big advantages to doing so. Um, there, there is a jail command built in to FreeBSD, and. Basically, what you do is you install FreeBSD into a directory within the host and then say, jail, run from that. In fact, I've known a coworker to install Linux into a FreeBSD host and then jail that. And the reason he was doing that was because he was doing some, uh, he was building a driver for something that didn't exist for an older version of Linux that someone needed. And every time he did the make install, it would overwrite the OS that was installed. And all he had to do was do a ZFS rollback, get back to where he was, make changes to tweak the install, and repeat that process until he built the driver. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's pretty handy. That way you don't have to like so, deal with backing out all these changes yeah. or deal all that local yeah. state. You're just like, no, yeah. I have a snapshot. No problem. Roll back. Woo. That's I'm awesome. Gone. Everything's forgiven. Copy on, right? Isn't it great? Ah, uh, it's very nice. Uh, so basically there there is a built-in jail command, which a lot of people use. Uh, I know the FreeBSD infrastructure is heavily jailed and they all just use the, the, the jail command. Uh, okay. when you're when you're installing FreeBSD, you can say install to that directory over there. Just install it there. Thank you. Goodbye. And then you then you run the jail from there. Um, there are probably two main competitors or, or user land tools to manipulate jails. I've long used Easy Jail. Um, okay. It it, ha it has a concept of using a, sh a lot of shared base directories, like instead of uh, user bin uh, and user s bin or at bin and s bin being copied to each jail, it shares them. So you have a base jail and then it does sim links to that jail. The big benefit to that is that you can upgrade only the base jail and then that upgrades all, your, all the jails relying on that base jail. Oh, interesting. Uh, 
now the downside that to that to that is that doesn't do the merge master it doesn't upgrade your rc.d scripts in all the individual jails because those will be local and different so you still have to do that oh because you if you've changed those then there's no longer going to be yeah in the base image they're on top of it or whatever right i see yeah that makes sense so uh, i actually made a patch for easy jail that allowed you to use non-base jails like each jail would have its own um binaries and so that would actually then when you did the the upgrade you could just upgrade the jail and everything would would wind up being updated as well but it didn't get applied that that's okay i'm not worried about that i'm not Such better is the way of open I'm, I'm, source I'm not better sometimes. i'm not better um and then the the i i use easy jails on one two three maybe four hosts and, and i like it I use another tool called IO Cage uh, on two hosts, and maybe three, two, yeah, two hosts, and I like it as well. Um, it's just two different ways to do the the same thing. Um, now, IO Cage, there's two versions out there. One was written in Shell Script, but the more recent version is written in Python, and that's what I what, what I'm using on the two new hosts. And it's what I recently, what I'm using on the new fresh port server. And the approach it takes is that you can have thin jails and thick jails. I think that's the approach that, that they call them. But basically, you can use a shared base jail or you can just have them all individual. And I take the approach of having them all individual. Um, it is possible to run older binaries within a jail, but you can't run newer binaries. So if you want want to run an 11.1 .1 jail, you really need an 11.1 .1 host. But you can run a 9.1 host on 11.1, .1, sorry, you can run a 9.1 .1 jail on an 11.1 .1 host. That's not a problem because they all, they all run the updated kernel. Oh, They'll right. all be running the same kernel. They'll all be running the FreeBSD 11.1 .1 kernel, for example. So each gel doesn't get its own kernel. They all run the main kernel. That's an important difference in between um, you know, running yeah. something in virtualization versus here in a container yeah. or jail. Mm -hmm. But if you want to run a different kernel, you could always uh, use Beehive, which is a, a different type of virtualization, which is built into FreeBSD. There's a, there's a Beehive command. And in Beehive, you can run a completely different operating system a lot easier as well. Um, well let's, keep come in right mind, let's come back to that yep. uh, and first yep. hear from our uh, first sponsor this evening. I think that's time. Yeah, yes. right? I think so. So head on over to ixsystems.com slash techsnap. There, you will find an incredible vendor of amazing hardware for open source software. They've even got this incredible, it's so incredible, it's in fact the ultimate guide to buying a new server for open source. There's a ton of great problems you can avoid by reading this white paper. Maybe you're not buying any new hardware, but you know some people at your office or in small businesses that, that your friends and family own that, you know, they, they're tired of getting screwed by some of the other companies they've interfaced with. They're, they're tired of waiting in, in really long phone queues or having to open a thousand tickets to try to get a simple request fulfilled. Put an end to all that. Check out this free report. You'll really see what IX is all about. And just, just go head on over to ixsystems.com slash techsnap. Go check out their site. You'll really see what I'm talking about because they, they can do it all. Storage, servers, really just solutions. That's one of the things that puts IX apart is they've got a super talented team of sales engineers, storage engineers, people contributing to open source projects, working with the community, working with some of their huge customers. So if you're a little, if you're a little concerned, you're like, well, what's going on here with, uh, you know, IX? I haven't heard of them. Do they, have, do they have big customers? Do they have people that I can trust? Yes, absolutely. They do. Go look at some of their customers. People like LinkedIn, Sony, Disney, government agencies, University of California, Berkeley, NASA. These are people running serious experiments, doing serious workloads. People like Splunk that hosts, you know, billions and billions of logs. These are trusted customers of IX because IX has great partnerships with people like Intel and their incredible Intel processors. All this comes together. They've got the expertise. They've got the staff there. Give them a call. Uh, you know, you can buy stuff online. They got a great website, easily to configure things. But just give them a call. You'll see what we're saying. 
You'll talk to a friendly engineer who knows probably more than you do about just about any hardware that you're going to buy. So if you're not an expert in, in SaaS, enterprise storage controllers, SAN networking, any of that, not a problem. If you are, that's great. They'll be happy to work with you. Use your expertise as well. But if not, they're happy to help you out. Plus, they'll make sure everything's configured just how you want, ready to get shipped to a data center, racked up, turned on, put in production. It's it's beautiful. I love IX system just for that. They've got such reliability. And maybe maybe you don't need a big new server. Maybe you know, maybe you're on the cloud, you're doing other things, but you want to make sure you've got storage and backups at your house. Look no further than the FreeNAS Mini. This system is beautiful. It runs FreeNAS, the very popular open source NAS software developed by IX system. So you don't you can run it on your own hardware. But why would you? IX has got the best in the biz. Go play the video. Go look around at some of the, the promo shots they have of this thing because the hardware is meticulously engineered. They've learned over many versions now just what needs to be done. They engineer it with reliability in mind. There's actually a USB drive on the motherboard there uh, plugged in. That's what runs the base operating system. And then all the data is stored on ZFS, of course, on the hard drive. So it's super easy to replace. If anything breaks, you can just slot on a new version of the OS. Everything comes right up. The data is all stored on ZFS. Your array gets mounted. It just works. It's got a super nice, easy to use web UI. So you can configure things like Beehive. You can run other, all kinds of things on it. You can expose it as, as NFS shares. You can expose it as Samba. A lot of great options. It's perfect for small home office, medium-sized office even, or just, just your house. You know, you want to make sure that you, you take a lot of pictures. You have cute pictures of your family. Don't lose them. Buy a free NAS Mini. You can get them right on Amazon or order them straight from IX. It's super easy. And while you're there, just one more thing. Go check out their blog because this is maybe where it's the most fun. You'll really see all the cool conferences they go, like BSD DW. They were just there. Conference recap. Go learn about it. Or Lisa. Lisa is cool. It's a large installation system administration conference. These are people that run serious systems. Go check out some of IX's takeaways. They always have really smart people go there. Go look, look, listen to talks. Go talk to the people in the industry. They were also just at the OpenZFS Developer Summit. So they're at all the places. They're in with the community. And that that's what makes them such a great provider. Go check out ixsystems.com slash techsnap today. And thank you to IX for sponsoring the TechSnap program. All right. Well, we're talking jails, zones, containers, all things containerization, mm-hmm. really. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dan, you've given us a pretty good roundup so far of you know, the, the basic parts of what are jails, why would you use them, in what circumstances are they helpful? I'm a little, I've played a little bit with jails. I'm a little curious, though, not an expert on FreeBSD. I have a couple boxes. I use them regularly, but I haven't done this as advanced things as I've done on some Linux systems. Uh, so networking on FreeBSD has always been a little bit different. I'm not not as familiar. I've, I've heard that, that FreeBSD jails, like, they each get their own IP address. Is that accurate? How does networking work in general? That's always one of the things, you know... Mm-hmm. Um, Frequently, I'll have maybe I'll have a VM already running, or I'll have a system, and I want to split that up. And yep. sure, it's great to have multiple workloads, but I end up needing to have network connectivity at some point. So, what do I do? Yeah. All right. L- let's pretend you have one box with one public IP address. It has a web server and a mail server, and that's it. Let's just yeah. for this example. Sure. So your your one IP address will be on the on the main host. You can then share that IP address with each of the jails. And and then in each jail, you only have one one process as listening, and they're each listening on different ports. And so long as they're not trying to listen on the same port, you can share the IP addresses address throughout as many jails as you want. But you don't have to do that. You can give each jail a different IP address. Uh, when I set up the latest fr- fresh port server, <clears throat> there are four jails. Only one of them has a public IP address. All the rest have non-routable addresses. The one with a public IP address is running uh, a mail server. Okay. Uh, one of the ones uh, without a public IP address is running Postgres, but it only, it only gets talked to by the jail that's running Nginx, which doesn't have an I, a public IP address because the host just um, transfers the incoming traffic on port 80, port 443, from the main host into the jail. Okay. And so the, the, the jail is never talking on a public IP address. So does and it, then the, it must uh, have its own private IP address within the jail? Is there like yes, a, a local yes. host-only network for... Uh, well, you, you can just set... You, you can have them all communicate over LO0, but I tend not to. I, I tend to create LO1 
and mm. just reserve that for inter-jail communication. Okay. And so one jail might get 127 or sorry, 128 dot, I forget. But it'll be it won't be one two it won't be the normal local host address, which is is that one two eight zero zero one or is it one two seven zero zero one? One two seven. Okay. So it'll be one two seven something different. Right. You use another is part what of I put the, on the other the local yeah. address range. Yeah. Okay. J- just so it's in the in that range. And um and, but what is interesting is that all inter jail communication goes over L O zero on the main host. Oh, interesting. Even though that uh, even though that network adapter, we call it even though that Nick even though that device doesn't actually have that IP address, you'll see the traffic going over there. So you can snoop on all the jails if you were to capture from that. Yes. Hmm. Uh, if you're on the host and your root yeah. You can see everything going in the jail. You can do PS, PS, and you can see all the processes oh. running in every jail. Right, okay. So from a security point of view, observing jails is easy. Mm-hmm. You're just, you, can, you can see everything there. If you're, if you're the admin, you can see everything in every jail. But when you're in the jail, all you see is what is in the jail. Right. That's what makes it a jail, I suppose. One of the things. There yeah. is no escape. <laughs> right. Um, Okay, so that that makes sense. And so do they see, when they are sharing the public IP, do they see that, that interface? Does that interface live in the, on the main part of the host? Or do they, just, yep. do they still have their own? And B, FreeBSD mm-hmm. does this mapping of ports under the no. host. No. If your main IP address, if, if your main IP address is on the EM0 device, right. then the jail sees an EM0 device but only the IP addresses that you tell it that are on that. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I can do IF config EM zero and I'll see 70 different IP addresses, but in the jail, I only see the IP addresses that are assigned to that jail. Got it. Right. So I know um, um, from watching, uh, I think we'll have to add it to the show notes and it was linked in by one of your friends in a previous feedback. Uh, Brian Cantrell's excellent talk about uh, oh, yes. the papers. We love talk about zones and jails there was some talk mm-hmm. about a couple things uh, in particular like the limitations on sending like raw sockets uh, raw mm-hmm. like icmp requests as well mm-hmm. as so zones have this like fully virtualized network stack i think they call it crossbow um mm-hmm. and I, I believe jails has something similar is that currently is that in the well, kernel is it does it work is it, it's called like vnet or vimage i'm not an expert but maybe you can mm-hmm. enlighten us you said uh raw sockets you can't by default Raw sockets are disabled in jails. Okay. It's a security issue. Right. But you can enable raw sockets so that ICMP works. Okay. Um, and there is there is a VNet or is it VMNet? I think it may be VMNet. But yeah, I don't play around with that in jails, but a lot of people do, where basically you have your own complete uh, network stack and it allows the jails to do its own filtering and stuff like that. But I've never used that. I, I just basically let the host do all that. I'm not getting that complicated. There you go. Yeah, it, it is VNet, and I've never used it. But I've seen a lot of talk about it. I know that IO Cage is well set up for that. I don't know so much about EasyGL and that, but that's mostly because I've never ever had to play with it. There's been nothing in it that I I couldn't do that I wanted to do. Okay. Well, well, that's that's good to hear. Um, but yeah, there's a whole lot of virtualization in there. Um, now, w- one of the other things that's, that may not be obvious from what we said is that a jail is just a bunch of files on disk. And I, I, I have done this. I, I have tarballed up a jail and moved it to another host. And all you basically have to do on the receiving host is arrange the IP addresses that it's going to use or, or modify them in the jail, whichever approach you want to take. But that's basically all you have to do to move a jail. Um, there, there's, there's no software to install because it's all in the jail. Right, right. And so you can just the, pick this fir- up, tar it yep. up, ship it off, or yep. ZFS send, or whatever you're doing. And, and that is literally what you do. You tar it up and you move, copy it over to the other host. Right. It, it, it is just so cool. 
I remember the first time I did this because uh, I, I can't remember why, but I wanted to move a jail from one host to another. And there are commands in Easy Jail and I OK to archive this jail, please. OK, import this jail, please. Nice. And it was so much easier than I thought it was going <laughs> to be. It, it's easier than setting up a new host. I'll tell you that much. Right. So, I mean, I know for, for me, some on some systems, you... You know, I end up trying to just keep the main system super minimal because it, at this mm-hmm. point it's so much easier to just work with these jails or containers or yes. other things because you can you can blow them away yep. if you need to. You can restore them. You yep. can ship them off and move them. Yep. So you kind of just have and this main host that's all just for orchestrating all the containers that you're going to run. Everyone who, who's been playing around on computers will know the feeling of having having installed something on their host just to play with it and see if they like it and then say, nah, delete it. But yep. then there's all these dependencies that were installed with it. And you you're not really clean. sure if they're you. Yeah. You're not yes. really sure if they're being used and you're afraid to delete them because what's going to break. Well, solve that by creating a jail, doing all your playing in there. And when you're done, delete the jail and it's all gone. There's no craft in your host. It's so much easier. Oh, uh, that's beautiful. It's, just, it's very clean. It's very efficient. <laughs> Uh, awesome. Okay. Well, uh, anything else you want to talk about jails in particular before we move on into some of the container world? There, there's so much that you can talk about that I, I don't want to go too detailed into it. We're just trying to give everyone an overview of jails and containers. Yeah. But there's so many little tricks and things that you can do that are just make the make systems administration so much easier that we won't go into them. Unless people start giving us feedback and say, hey, listen, can you go and talk about this or that? Yes. Then then we'll go into that, but <laughs> Exactly. So, yeah. Tell me about containers. Why do containers exist? Well, all right, let's, Why not use jails? Well, you certainly could use jails. I thought we'd maybe start with a little history. Containers are um, somewhat of a messy subject on Linux, and we'll get to that. But first, I thought maybe we could just review. Uh, here's a good article over at... Um, Container Minds Medium talking about container history. So as we mentioned at the top, started off with Cheru, you know, back in, back in 1979 or so. It was added to BSD in 1982. Um, and Cheru is just, it's just a Unix operating system call for changing the root directory of a process. So that, that process and its children, they don't see root as the real root of the system. They see it as sub subtree of that system. So a lot of times you see it used for build processes or other activities where you run, hey, you, this process, your world is different. Uh, then next up, we have FreeBSD jails. Uh, you were just talking about the, you know, the original the papers and the blog posts about that. Um, you've just done a great job of describing what are jails, but it's you know another operating system call calls, etc. And but but this one uh, designed with security but, in mind. Yeah, I, I want to take issue with what he has there. He says this is introduced by Derek T. Woolworth at our R and D associate. Well, Derek did commission the work done by Paul Henning Camp. Oh, yeah, there we so go. Good Der- correction. D- Derek didn't do the work. Mr. Well, uh, the person quoted there paid Paul to do it. I'm, 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 according to what we just read here earlier. But anyway, I'll send a correction to them. Yeah, right, exactly. Just a little bit of the details. I'm sure they're written from a Linux mm-hmm, perspective, mm-hmm. so didn't didn't quite capture yep. that. No, 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 it's no big deal. Okay, so after really? that, obviously jails took the community. You know, people were like, oh, yeah, this makes a lot of sense roots really aren't good enough um we want to have something that can do more of these things have more restrictions be more of a jail or a container um so in 2001 there's linux v server uh, it's kind of similar in mechanism to jails but it never made it into the actual uh kernel so you had you had these different partitions it hasn't seen much use except for in some vps hosting companies especially in the 2000s and so this is one of one of several we'll see out of kernel patch sets that were applied to try to add this functionality to linux um, after that comes Solaris containers, uh, which are really usually called zones. I don't know why they have them called that here, but that's fine. Uh, so if Solaris, go watch uh, Brian Cantrell's excellent talk. Oracle's, of course, got some documentation on zones as well. Uh, they took the, the jail idea and kind of just ran with it, um, really built it deep into the Solaris operating system. You can go now play with it with Open, Open Indiana or Lumos, or any of those Lumos distributions. Um, and so they have, they have, we won't go too much into it because I'm not an expert. I don't know if you have played much with zones, but you get a lot of what you have with jails in that they are this, um, you know, this can really a jailing mechanism. You have a root zone and then you can make zones off of that where things are contained. They have their own 
They only have their own network stack. They have their own mounts. They have their own, you know, all these things so that you can control what they're doing. In particular, Joyent has done a lot of work introducing all kinds of different, like, flavored zones, the Linux flavored zone, which will let you run Linux software, much like FreeBSD can do. So there's a lot of cool options there. Zones are a fascinating world in their own right. I definitely recommend go reading more about it because obviously Sun did a lot of um, good work following along what the FreeBSD project did. Back to the Linux side of things, a little bit later in 2005, we have OpenVZ. Uh, OpenVZ is another one of these out-of-tree patch sets that's actually seen a ton of use. Um, if you used a VPS any time before uh, like 2010, probably, you almost certainly used an OpenVZ VPS if it was a Linux system. Uh, and this kind of did the same thing. It's really quite similar to Jails in many respects in that it is, you know, Jails have been used for a long time um, if, if this is accurate, Dan, feel free to jump in, of course, uh, you know, but but are used, like, if you have a FreeBSD system um, to have multiple users run them or multiple processes, and maybe you don't trust those processes, right? So people, some people sell FreeBSD access where you can have, you know, you can have access to a jail. Um, you won't have to have your whole own system, but you have your own little ver FreeBSD world there that you can use. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that's what most... Uh, um resellers like I, i'm sure that's what mo most virtual hosts you're buying now are they're, they're jails they're not real hosts unless unless, you're unless explicitly for stated yeah so i I'm, I'm going to guess that most very inexpensive hosts that you can buy now and even some of the expensive hosts are just virtualization done done with jails but in the same way that what you get on aws is a jail something like that but no. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying that AWS no, is no, no, using no, I, jails. I, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so OpenVZ is, is similar. It's out of it's out of tree. They use a lot of Linux features, but they also have some of their own that implement a lot of this behavior. But it is designed around and almost exclusively used by hosting providers to provide VPSs. So you don't get your own kernel, but you do get your own. You know, you look. It looks like your root. You have root in your in your VPS. You can do things, and the host system is protected so that they can let a bunch of untrusted users run different things on one system and be able to sell that to the public. So that's been around. It's actually, it's still actively maintained. It's still used a lot of places. Um, I, I know like a lot of seed box companies and other things that are selling, like you don't need a full virtual machine, uh, but if you just need access to Linux to be able to run on the web, boom, here you go. It's cheap, it's easy. And it's, you know, obviously you get the increased density that comes with containers rather than VMs. All right, so after that, um, Google obviously runs a whole bunch of computers on the internet, and they take they take security and other things and resource constraints seriously for a long time. So, process containers is something Google implemented around 2006, and they wanted to be, have more ability to limit, uh, you know, for limiting accounting and isolation of different things, things like CPU, memory, disk I/O, network, all the all the base primitives of an operating system. Eventually, this was renamed to control groups to avoid confusion confusion around multiple terms of the term container um so this was around linux kernel 2624 uh google's had their hand in containerization pretty much since the beginning but thankfully they've done a great job working upstream and a lot of that stuff's come back right into the regular kernel uh, so they renamed control groups in 2007 ish and they're now c groups so that's something we'll, we'll talk about more c groups are a pretty essential part of what we are calling containerization on linux we'll get more into what c groups are after that, um, something that actually has the name container in it, uh, LXC, which stands for Linux Containers. And this was introduced around 2008. Um, Ubuntu was one of the people, projects, uh, Canonical was really into this. Today, they, they sponsor it and host it. Uh, I think they pay the salary of the lead developer on the project. And it uses these kernel APIs, C groups, namespaces. We'll talk more about those. Um, and it presents uh, also kind of like a jail-like interface. It's... It's designed around, you know, having your own system, like a small Linux distribution, whether that be Debian or Ubuntu, it doesn't have to be what matches the host system. It creates its own, almost like a virtualization host where you have your own, you know, you have an init system, you're running all these processes, it looks like a real host, you can get into it, you can run SSH in there, all that just works. So LXC was kind of first out of the gate in terms of in kernel tree using kernel features containerization on linux and it still exists uh one of the problems with lxc is it didn't wasn't very developer friendly and it didn't have quite as good tooling as even like let's say jails or other things let alone compared to say docker uh so it worked pretty well for experienced sysadmins so like uh, travis ci 
uh, the the continuous integration server. They use LXC, I believe. Oh, actually, they use an OpenVZ. Uh, excuse me, CircleCI uses LXC un- underneath. So there's, these are all getting used by companies, but they're not. A lot of them didn't end up with the with the same amount of hype or discussion. It kind of reminds me of FreeBSD in a way where it's like you know people in the know use FreeBSD, but it doesn't get talked about at the same level by like amateur users in the way that like Linux does. Let's say which you may not feel is right, and, and I would agree with you, but that's sort of how it's at. So people use LXC, it's used, but it doesn't, hasn't seen the same sort of adoption um, as Docker has in the Linux world. Uh, there's been a few other players that have come here because, much like in FreeBSD, you have, you know, IOCage, EasyJail. Because these are implemented on kernel features, there's, there's some different things. Warden is one that came out in 2011 by Cloud Foundry. This one was a little more... Um, it can also work on other operating systems. It was sort of yeah. a user land wrapper. Uh, I'm familiar with something called Warden on PCBSD, now True OS. I'm not sure if it's the same thing. We'll have Be to dig into to that find later. Out. Yeah. yeah. Um, then Google came out with uh, something a tool called Let Me Container That For You. This is around uh, 2013. Uh, it's an open source version of the container stack Google was using inside Google, um, and it provided, provided a bunch of helpers around uh, containers. So it, it kind of had a bunch of tools that would let you say, like, here's my service. I want to run this in a container. And then you use let me contain that for you. And there you go. You get a container. Um, so provided, you know, nice performance, good resource utilization control, shared resources, all that sort of stuff. Um, and really was the root of what a lot of what has turned into mainstream containers on Linux. Um, there's no longer being developed. Don't go use it. There's better things to use, which we'll talk about. Uh, after that, comes Docker. Docker is obviously the heavy hitter in the room in Linux containers. That's what everyone's talking about. There's now a Docker con that's attached to like the Linux conventions. It, it's crazy. Uh, it's definitely the most popular, widely used container management system. Uh, it was developed as an internal project as a, at a platform as a service company called Dot Cloud, and they later renamed themselves to Docker. Uh, similar to Warden, Docker also used LXC um, in the beginning. So the early versions of Docker would shell out to LXC. LXC would go use namespaces and C groups to build you a container, and Docker was kind of just a layer on top. Um, that's no longer true. Docker's done a bunch of work and put all of the containerization stuff, the stuff that talks to the underlying operating system, in a project called libcontainer. So that's what you want to look for. Um, we'll talk about that too with, as with run C, which is based off libcontainer. And then Docker is a, is a daemon that sits on top and gives you provides you all the access to that. So you can talk to it over a REST API. It's got a, it's got a command line tool that you interface with. Um, and so Docker is now like the most popular. There are several competing things that are in the same space, one of those being Rocket. Um, Rocket is made by CoreOS folks, and it's, it's very much like Docker in that it provides a REST API you can talk to, but it, it was designed a little more with security first in mind, so it has a little bit different workflow. It also hasn't seen the same kind of adoption as Docker, uh, but thankfully there's been a lot of good upstream work to sort of combine things so that like with the open container initiative, those sorts of organizations that a lot of times you can run the same software, be it in Docker or in in Rocket. And at the end of the day, that's pretty much just a root file system image. So that's how we get to where we are today. Docker's seen a whole bunch of more changes, including things like being renamed to Mobi, uh, trying to restructure some of their organization. There's also now containers on Windows that Docker Docker can, can play with. Uh, so there's all kinds of stuff. It's it's kind of a mess, uh, and it can be pretty confusing. You're like, well, what am I, what am I actually trying to use here? What are containers? There's a lot of names on the top, things like Docker, Run C, LXC. Mm-hmm. It's 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 pretty confusing. Here's a link we've talked about before, and uh, I think it kind of explains it pretty well. And this is over at Jesse Frizzell's blog. She does a lot of awesome work in this space. Setting the record straight. Containers, zones, jails, VMs. Like, what's going on here? Um, I think she, she gets it right. This whole thing is a great article. It ex- explains things very nicely. Right out the bat, the design of Solaris zones, BSD jails, VMs, and containers are all very different. And it's important to recognize that because they do, like, they they may look the same on the surface and for a lot of workflows, but they have been designed very differently. So... It's pretty clear uh, from the Solaris design spec and the BSD jails handbook that, you know, these are like real things. They're first class primitives in the operating system. You won't find the word container in the Linux kernel source. Well, you will, but it's not the containers that you think you're thinking of, right? So it just doesn't work out that way. Instead, in the Linux side of things, they're built off a couple primitives, the first of which is called C groups, uh, also known as control groups. So we talked about this a little bit. The other one is namespaces. Now, what are these? What are these things? 
Yeah, of course, you can find some good information all over the internet, uh, but probably the best resources is to just go check out some of the mm-hmm. documentation in the kernel, or you can go over to LWN, which always has good app, good stuff. So a namespace, we'll start with namespaces. Um, a namespace wraps a global system resource in an abstraction that makes it appear to the processes within the namespace that they have their own isolated instance of the global resource. Changes to the global resource are visible to other processes that are members of the namespace, but are invisible to the other processes. One use of namespaces is to implement containers. So there's a couple, here they list some of the different namespaces that exist. You've got uh, C group namespace, IPC namespace, network namespace, that one's super important, the mount namespace, PID namespace, user namespace, and the UTS namespace. Um, and these are a lot of what you were, you were talking about, right? So like in, in jails, if I'm in a jail, I can't see the processes in a different jail. You can see it from the no. root run, but you keep, right? And so no. namespaces are what achieve that effect. Uh, in particular, the PID namespace on Linux, that's what gives you separate PIDs, right? So if you're in a jail or if you're in a container over here, you have a PID one, that's your init system maybe, or whatever process is being containerized. You can't see any processes that are in the main main namespace. You can't see any in a different namespace. Um, so each process on Linux is in one of these, or it's in all the namespaces, but then you can have multiple versions of those, right? So I'm in this, if I'm process A, I'm in one version of a C group namespace, I'm in one version of a mount namespace, and that's how you can kind of tune those things. So when you go to make a new process, uh, usually with like, let's say the clone system call, then you specify more things like, hey, I want this process to have a new namespace. One in particular for me, uh, network namespaces are super useful because this is the like network part of Linux containers, much like crossbow on in zones where you get a new, basically like your new network stack. So you have your own routing table, you have your own IP tables rules. My router at home is actually just a container running on one of my servers. And so I'm able to make a new network namespace. Mm-hmm. Then I can move my actual physical NIC into that namespace. And then um, network namespaces rely on what's known as a virtual ethernet pair. And it's just like a dumb pipe where you put in a packet on one side of it and the packet comes out on the other side. And you use that to sort of tie namespaces together. So then I, I make one of these pairs. I put one end of the pair in my router namespace and I put one in my main host namespace. And then I'm able to do networking just like you want, right? You can set up IP tables rules. You can set up firewalls. You can set up routing between them. It's useful to actually contain things and um, you know, for real purposes. And it's also super useful for simulation. You can submit up a whole bunch of network namespaces, route between them, uh, simulate t- topologies, do like tests of, you know, maybe you're trying to simulate distributed systems. It's super useful for all of that. It also makes it really handy. Like, let's say you want some programs to always use a VPN and you don't want them to be able to connect to the internet if that VPN connection goes down. Start up your VPN, move the VPN interface into a network namespace, run all your processes in that network namespace, problem solved. So uh, they're super handy that way. There's a couple others that are important. Mount namespaces are basically the better version of Chirrut uh, in the namespace world, where that just lets you have your own mounts that other namespaces can't see. And then maybe the most controversial of these is the user namespace. That one's taken the longest to develop. Um, Mm -hmm. We've talked about it a few times on this show because there's been some security vulnerabilities in it as they've gotten that kind of all ironed out. These days, it's actually doing really well. It's used in a lot of places. Docker's finally upstreamed it, gotten it into into main Docker. It's used in a lot of other tools and most kernels, not all of them, but most distribution kernels now have user namespaces enabled. For a long time, they weren't enabled by default. So you had to, had to kind of, you know, if you wanted them, you either compile them or using a distribution that did use them. Thankfully, like Ubuntu's had them enabled for a while. So that's been pretty good. The user namespace, uh, make sure that you have your own set of UIDs in your container. So that root in a container is not root on the host. And it does that by kind of allocating some UID ranges from the main one and then doing a mapping so that, sure, you're UID one in the container, but really you're like 10,001 on the host system. And so even if you break out of the container because that your real UID isn't root in the main namespace, you still don't have root privileges. So it's an, it's an additional security exercise that makes it so that root is constrained. So that's namespaces. Yeah. yeah. Now, I know of examples, even on my own host, where UID 1001 is one user in one jail and a different user in another jail. And that's okay because there's no confusion because those users do not interact because they're in different jails. But when your root 
and you do an ls minus l on files within the jail from the host you get different output than if you do ls minus l within the jail because the ls minus l within the jail will use the uids and gids specific to that jail whereas the host will use the uids and gids relative to the host okay i see okay mm -hmm. so i can see that files within the jail that are normally mine actually belong to another user if i look at it from the host that makes sense because that uid in the host is another user right now people may say but that lets the host that lets a user in the host modify what's in the jail well yeah that's often by design right you you're you're assuming that the host uh, has has more privileges in this domain yes. than, than yes. anything running in the jails. If you're on the host, you have different privileges. Yeah. And but that overlap there, no, I, I haven't seen that be a problem. But it can be a problem when you've got Postgres running on the host and Postgres running in different jails as well. And generally, what I do there is I just change the UID of the Postgres daemon or the Postgres user in the various hosts. Oh, okay, I see. So do you are you required to do that then? You like, have to do some of that mapping? Um, it, it used to be highly recommended uh, because of uh, system V memory, shared z uh, system V memory, oh, system right. 5. Yep. Um, but I think later versions of Postgres don't use that memory. Okay, then they, you're going to rely on that feature. So it's, yeah. yeah, so it, it's not an issue. So uh, uh, the regression testing jails that I talked about, e each runs a different user ID for Postgres for historic reasons. But I think when I go to install Postgres 10 in a new jail, I don't think I have to worry about it quite so much. That makes sense. All right, well, we can let's go talk about cgroups. But first, let's talk about our next sponsor. That's our friends over at Ting. Head on over to techsnap.ting.com. You'll find a smarter way to do mobile. Now, I mean, like, what makes it smarter? Well, let's say you're really enjoying this discussion. You want to go call up your friend, and you're, you really want to just have a big, long chat about containers. And you're like, man, I've been reading all about containers, listening about containers. I'm super excited. Let's talk about it. You might... You're going to need a phone for that, right? You're going to need a phone, but you don't want to get trapped by these big phone companies that want to make you sign up for a two-year contract. Maybe you don't usually use a phone. You just want it for a couple times a month. Ting is perfect for that. Why? Head on over to the rates page, and it pretty much just explains itself. But don't worry, I'll still explain it to you. The deal is this. You only pay for what you use. So lines start at just $6 a month. You have two lines, that's 12. You have three, that's 18. You're already paying like nothing, right? So $6 a month, that's one hamburger, and you get access to a phone. It's per, it's great, it's easy, and it's it's simple. It's especially great if you're a small business, maybe you, or maybe you just want to get a phone for some family members. They don't use it much, but you want to make sure that if you want to call them, they have that. Or for, you know, a nanny for your child, um, an employee of yours, Ting makes it super simple. There's no, like, additional fees or anything like that. If they don't use it, it's just $6 a month. Then you pay for what you use in minutes, messages, and megabytes. So if you don't use any minutes, why, that's zero dollars. Maybe you use a bit. Grandma calls every now and then, three dollars a month. Text messages, I hope you don't have to use these because they're archaic and there's better ways to do. But if you do, still pretty cheap. Maybe a couple people send you texts, hundred dollars, or hundred, hundred texts, three dollars. It all explains it there. You just kind of fall into whichever bucket you hit, add those up. That's the cost. That's what you pay. There's a couple taxes and fees. Ting can't do anything about that. That'll depend on your local area. But other than that, it's just what you see right here on the page. So finally, I'm going to choose some megabytes. And thankfully, thankfully, I don't have to use too many, right? Because Wi-Fi is everywhere. Ting is great if you are Wi-Fi savvy. So if you're, you know, if you're in the office a lot, maybe you work from home. A lot of places, the buses even have Wi-Fi now. If that's your life, then Ting is perfect because if you can do Wi-Fi calling, if you can do, you know, maybe you don't use a messaging platform that uses data and not SMS, perfect. You will use hardly a thing. And even if you do, what's great about Ting is it's just data. There's no overage charges. There's no, like, contract where you say, like, well, I'm going to pay you always for this much data, even if I don't use it or even if I use more. It's, it's silly. Ting, it's just pay for what you use. 
And at the end of all of that, what makes that great is like, yeah, okay, pay for what you use. That makes sense. That's probably how it should have always been, Wes. I get that. It's also pretty darn cheap, right? So here we go. Got a phone. We've got minutes. We've got messages. And we've got data. Let's say you're using a gig of data, which like I hardly ever go over that. Your monthly bill is $28. I challenge you to go find anywhere else you can get that low and get all those same kind of services. You get pretty much everything you want, like three-way calling, tethering, voicemail, like every all the features you've come to expect from any other provider. Boom. You've got them right here on Ting. It's perfect. It's easy to use. And like they've got CS, uh, GSM and CDMA. So whichever phone you might have, they've got a great bring your own device page, BYOD. Yeah, that's right. Uh, where you can go check, put in your IMEI, see if your phone is qualified to be on the Ting network. It probably is. I can't guarantee that now, but go check. It's worth it. Or maybe you want to get a new phone, right? You're like, hey, hey, it's almost Christmas time. I want to get a brand new phone. Boom. Go over to their shop. You can get the Apple iPhone X. They've got that. I think it's actually the 10. Excuse me. They've got the Samsung Galaxy Note 8, all the latest and greatest. You can also go buy a phone straight from Googs if that's what you like to do. That's what I like to do. Bring it on over to the Ting network. Not a problem. And best of all, I can't believe I haven't mentioned this yet. When you when you go to texttime.ting.com, you'll get a $25 service credit. So if you go buy one of those fancy new phones, they'll apply that there. Otherwise, it'll get applied to your first month's bill. Either way, you're saving a bunch of money, both from that awesome discount and because Ting is just a great deal. So don't waste any more time. Don't waste any more money. Head on over to techsnap.ting.com. And thank you to Ting for sponsoring the TechSnap program. All righty then. So, what were we talking about? Oh, we were talking about containers. Containers. Okay. So on Linux, there's another one other primitive that you're going to need to know about if you're talking about containers. Mm-hmm. And that's called control groups or C groups for short. And so we've talked about namespaces. And namespaces provide the different world aspect of containers. Those are the things that make it look like you're on a different system. So if you've got your own namespace for all of those different sorts of namespaces we talked about, so you have your own mounts, you have your own network, you have your own PID, you have your own users, suddenly you start looking a lot like you're on a virtualized machine. You're on your own. You know, you have everything your own. You can't see anything from the host system. So that's that aspect. But another important part of containers, at least in day-to-day use, especially if you're going to have more than one running on one machine, is you're going to need to be able to control those things, right? You're going to be able to make sure that one can't use the entire host, that you can have multiple operating on the same thing and being polite and sharing resources. That, that's where control groups come in. So Here's some documentation over at Red Hat because they usually do a good job. Uh, here's, uh, you know, so they're talking about Red Hat Enterprise 6, but it's on in all sorts of modern kernels. And this new feature, Control Groups, they allow you to allocate resources such as CPU time, system memory, network bandwidth, or combinations of these resources among user-defined groups of processes running on a system. You can monitor the C groups you configured. You can deny C groups access to certain resources and even reconfigure your C groups dynamically on a running system. These are all like super useful. You can go head on over to LWN as well. We'll have that in the show notes. They've got a really good part, deep dive into control groups, the history, what it is, how they work, all of that. But what you need to know is that much like namespaces, each process is in one of these C group hierarchies. Um, so when you start the system, you know, in it is in uh, the, the base C group for each different type of C group that you have, much like namespaces, actually kind of exactly the same. And from there, you can make new ones, place processes into them and control them example of this is the memory C group. So you can make make a memory C group, move a process into it, and then you can configure both soft and hard limits that will constrain the amount of memory processes in that group are allowed to use. Now, that one's particularly useful because uh, Linux has something called the out-of-memory killer. So if your system is under crazy memory pressure, you're out of memory, something's got to go. Uh, Linux has a kernel feature that will go try to kill a process to free up some memory. If you're using C groups, this is immediately less of a problem because it's the out of memory killer operates per C group. So if you have some really big, heavy C group over here, you can you know allocate this much resource and then keep a certain amount of memory over here for let's say your SSH daemon, other management tools, so you don't won't have a case where your you know your system starts thrashing out of memory and you can't get access to go troubleshoot it. Boom, no problem. C groups do that. They also allow some other mechanisms there. So like instead of killing a process, you can have the C group send a notification to another process outside the C group, and that can decide to kill the C group, maybe stop it, take other actions, send a user notification, 
Um, so it really lets, gives you these sorts of primitives to control like what devices you can see, what network things you have access to, how much resources, uh, CPU scheduling, you can pin things to CPUs, you can say like you're only allowed to use this much, um, this much share of the CPU resources when competing with others. So between namespaces and C groups, you can add these together and you get something that looks roughly like a container. Um, and you can do this all manually, you can do it all with system calls, but you probably don't want to. And then that's where you get into some of the, some of the user land systems, the user land utilities that you're going to use on Linux. So we talked about LXC already. Um, there's a new version of that called LXD, which uses LXC underneath, also known as LexD, I believe. Um, and that, that comes out of Canonical. They work on that a lot. And that focuses, they call themselves a lighter visor. And it looks a lot like jails. They use a few other utilities, things like SecComp, which uh, configures capabilities. Capabilities take what you would think of as root permissions, root powers, and d divide them into a set of capabilities. So like the capability to listen on ports under 10, 1024, right? That's, that's one capability. You can use SecComp to configure, like, I want this process to only have this subset of available capabilities. Between things like that and then Linux security implementations like AppArmor or SE Linux, you layer all those together, and that gets you sort of a complete container picture where you have security, you have containment, you have namespacing, you have control over the resource allocations. And between all of those, you've got something that looks somewhat like a container. Does that make sense? Yeah, I followed it. And as you were saying things, I said, oh, that's what I should mention. Oh, I should mention that because you use the word CPU pin. And I've already, I'd, I'd already typed down tying CPU to a jail, but I couldn't remember what it was. And that's what it was. CPU pin gave, gave me the ability to remember that it is actually CPU set on FreeBSD. And yeah, I, I should be doing that in my um, in my jails saying, hey, listen, this process here, always run it on that CPU. This process, always run it on that CPU, just so that you don't wind up having two very intense processes competing for a CPU. They each have their own CPU. And that's easy to do if you've got a box with, say, five or six CPUs. But yeah, it's a lot. it's something I've never used, but I should look at. Now, what was the other thing you mentioned that made me think uh, of mm, fibs? Um, I thought I looked that up. I thought I had that open. I don't see it now. But fibs is something they can look up. Uh, it allows you to have a different routing table for different processes. Oh, yeah. You can tie that to a gel as well. Okay, nice. So you mentioned routing tables. And that, yes. that, that's what brought it to mind. And I, I know people that use them all the time, but I've never had a need for them. I've never seen a need for them. But I can understand, like, if you have a process as, that is only a, say, a monitoring process and it's not supposed to interact with the network, you can always make it so that it, it never sees the default route that goes out to the network. Totally. It only sees the default network that goes over the back channels. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. I've used it for things like exactly like that. So that makes a lot of sense. Oh, you have? Oh. Well, not your, that, no, the Linux version, no. not the jail version. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I didn't know that you guys had the same thing. I thought it was only in R. So. Yeah, right. So um, if you, when you make a new network namespace in Linux, by default, it doesn't have access. It just ha all it has is a loopback address. So any process running into it, that's, that's all it can see. Uh, you can share the main namespace with it if you want to, or you can make these yeah. VETH pairs or move a different interface into that namespace. But by default, it's just isolated. Yeah, but by default in FreeBSC, a jail has nothing. Yeah, right. It has no networking, no nothing. So m many a time I've gone and created a jail and say, hey, use this IP address, but that IP address doesn't exist in the host. Then you get into the jail and you say, well, there's nothing here. What's going on? And people may ask, well, how do you get into the jail if you have nothing going on? If you have no network, how have you gotten into the jail? And you get into the jail by, uh, well, what I do is easy, easy jail admin console jail name. 
and oh, that just yeah. is a fancy way of doing a CH root. And so you're in the jail with no with without having come come in over a TCP IP. You've just CH rooted into it, and, and you can try this at home. You can set up a directory and do a CH root as root into that directory as a non-privileged and become a non-privileged user user at the same time. And you have nothing. You can't do LS. You can't do <laughs> anything because you've CH rooted your, yourself away. And I use this uh, for fresh ports. When, when, it's, when it's running make on all the ports to extract information, I want to do that in isolation so as not to be affected by what's running on the host, which is really a jail, but it's on a host. So I do a CH root into there. And, and yeah, you, you, you have to do these sim links from the host, which are read only, for all the commands that you would normally run, like ls, ps, whatever. They all have sim links in there. Uh -huh, and that's similar yes. to doing a jail. But the first thing that the, the process does when it goes to, when fresh ports goes to evaluate what new values are in a port, does a ch root into one of the directories it has there. And the way it gets out, out of it is it, it's just running one command, so it's ch root and a command. So if you want to do a ch root, you would do a ch root, the directory, the user, and then the command you want to run, which in your case would be slash bin slash sh, for example. Right. And then to exit the jail, you just do control D. And then you're done. Yeah. But don't interpret that as saying, hey, you can break out of a jail just by doing a control D. No, because what you've done is a ch root and you exit that, the, the jail terminates. That's not what happens when you do control D when you've SSH'd into a jail because that just kills your SSH session. Yeah, right. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, so on yeah. Linux, on the Linux side of things, you have multiple ways to kind of get to containers. You can do a lot of things by hand. Um, most Linux systems these days are running systemd, not all, but, but many of them. And systemd... Part of the reason uh, a lot of people were upset with it uh, is that it uses a bunch of Linux-only features, things like cgroups. So when you use systemd, it already splits up a bunch of your services into cgroups. And this makes it really easy to do things like manage what resources they have. When you're defining a new service, it makes it super simple to say like, hey, make a new cgroup, give it these memory limits, give it this disk throughput limit, uh, and then go start it up. It gets put in its own cgroup. You can then do you know, per C group accounting, resource allocation, and control. Uh, systemd also has a way to work with namespaces, and that's the systemd nspawn tool, uh, nspawn for namespace spawn. Uh, and that lets you set up a new system. It can also interface with the C groups, uh, but it, it lets you do various levels of namespacing to start up a process. So one of the really handy things that you might want to do is like you're talking about like a like a cheroot. Maybe you want to just do use it to build something. Maybe you want to run a different distribution of Linux inside a container really quick. Systemd does that really simply. You just have a you know you just have a folder on disk. You say systemd n spawn. Actually, they've got a, they've got an example right down here on this page. Um, so if you wanted to say, let's say I'm running my Ubuntu machine and I wanted to run uh, a Debian user land, I wanted to build some Debian packages maybe, uh, or I had a service that was easy to run on that system and I wanted to do it that way. Not a problem. Uh, here they, this is on a Fedora system as an example. So they install some tools to get Debian created. Uh, they run debootstrap, which is going to go bootstrap a very basic Debian file system, right? So that'll install all the base, but basically like installing base in FreeBSD into a folder. Uh, and then you just run systemd nspawn d, pass that the argument of the folder you want to do, uh, and give it a name, and that'll spin up a new thing. It'll build a mount namespace where the container only has access to that directory you passed it, and launches up a launches up a new container. So then you'll see this. You can run them non-interactively, but by default this will run it in interactive mode. So then you'll get a new prompt. You'll be in a shell inside the container, and you can go you know have at it. It also provides a bunch of nice tooling. One of the one of the ones people use a lot is uh, you can just pass it an argument to say use a shared network namespace. And so this is where some of the differences come into play. Jails obviously have these have features to share these things like you were talking about, but um, because containers are built on these like more granular primitives, you can stack whichever ones you might want. So a handy one in systemd nspawn is that you don't make a new network namespace. So then instead of having to deal with like 
making a new network namespace where you have to like go, maybe you have to attach these VETH pairs and put them on a bridge and then run NAT so that they all have NAT behind your one public IP address or anything like that. You just share the public IP address. All of the all of the systems you end spawns can see it. And so if you're, you know, you're running a, a make file that needs to go fetch some stuff from the internet, it just works. Uh, system D end spawn is mostly meant for like debugging, that sort of thing, not uh, in a security situation where you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to run it to run a host that you'd expose to the internet with untrusted users. That's not really what it has in mind. There's other tools for that, stuff like Lexd or Docker. Um, but it's super handy, especially if you're just on a system D system, you already have it installed most likely. You can run containers all day. That's actually what I'm using to run a couple of the ones at, at my house just to play with it, and it works really well. Um, and then, of course, there's like Docker itself. And where Docker really sets itself apart is being, being made with developers in mind, with a development life cycle. A lot of this other container stuff, well, the, well I don't like the delineation between developers and system administrators or ops people or any of that. Uh, you know, there's some, some people that are more focused on running the systems, some people more focused on like the actual applications. And for a lot of stuff in the Linux world, there just wasn't that much focus on the people writing applications. There was a lot of like, well, here's how you can make containers and you can put stuff in them and configure them, but it didn't have any of the the higher level stuff. And that's really what Docker brings. Uh, Docker brings like a whole workflow where you, you can install it on your, your own system. You can start using it, spin up Docker containers. Um, they also really focus on one process or one service per container. And a lot of this is just be so that you can use more, better resources so that be if you run less things in one C group, then you have less things that the out of memory killer will attack. You have less things that, you, you know, you have more granular controls to be able to control all of those things. And so rather than run a full system container that has its own init process, Docker really focuses on just running like one process. Maybe it spawns a couple sub processes, but you really want to just like, if you're running Postgres, you would just start you'd have a file system that had enough stuff in it that Postgres needed, you know, very minimal, and you'd just run the Postgres, pro, Postgres process and allow the system, the main system's init process to do all the normal init stuff and then just run that process in a tiny little container and then you spin up all of these. And then well, like, to, to make that workflow work, Docker has this notions of, of images and the ability to share them. So there's this Docker hub, there's Docker files. You make a Docker file, you kind of specify, you say like, all right, well, starting with you can start with just like a, a tarball that you can import from, but a lot of them, people have made those already, right? So Ubuntu publishes a, a package. There's a, a distribution called Alpine, which is really minimal. That one's very popular with Docker. Debian has them, Arch has them. And you can start with, say, like an Ubuntu container file system, tell it to install some apps, maybe tell it to install your custom application that you've built. It packages those all up in a layered file system and saves it off basically just as a tarball but it has metadata with it. And so you can then put that, you can upload it to a public repository. There's also a notion of private Docker repositories. We've got one at my office, for instance. And so that's super useful too, where you can then have multiple developers. It basically, it makes the Docker images into like a versioned binary artifact. So you can build one on your local machine, test it there, develop against it, then like have it, you know, when you're happy with those changes, go push it through your build system. The build system will go build an official one, go test it in QA, it passes in QA, you use exactly the same bits on disk, the exact same package, you can move it right up into staging, move it right to production, and you have this like very, you have the sameness principle, it's really well applied, and it makes it super simple to share. You, If you want to go test it locally, because you're like, well, I think there might be a regression, you can just go talk to the registry, say, pull this down, put it on my machine, Docker handles all that very fluently. Now you could do that with all the other tools on Linux and, and anywhere else. It's just that Docker really put a lot of the focus into that because they wanted they wanted developers to adopt it and not just people who are trying to run secure systems. Okay, you mentioned a layered file system. Yeah. Explain what that is. Uh, well, so there's there's multiple aspects of it. Um, Docker, not well, all just, the time. Just, just an overview because I'm trying to understand what it is. Uh, it uses something called, well, there's, it's used several of them, but the most recent one is Overlay uh, FS. Actually, here, let's see. Overlay file system. It, it, it sounds like null FS mounting or like a, a union FS almost. Yeah. Overlay FS allows one usually read write directory tree to be overlaid onto another read only directory tree. All yeah, modifications is, go to the yeah. upper writable layer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, there it is. It said union right there. Yeah, you mean, yep, there yeah, you go. I understand. I understand now. Um, yeah, it's similar to like a copy on write where you take a snapshot and, or a clone of a file system and then all the 
all the underlying stuff is still there and anyone that's sharing it is still there, but right. uh, local rights are local only. So yeah. Okay. And that's a good um, point there. Copy and write is also a huge part to a lot of the container systems just in that like uh, Docker can interface with ButterFS, ZFS, um, device mapper, thin provisioning, as well as these overlay file systems. So you have copy and write either on the block layer or the file system layer or on the per file layer, depending on which way you do it. But all yeah. of those are to make it really easy to spin up, like you um, were talking about earlier, spin up multiple versions of the same thing with without having to wait. Yeah. So it, if you took your post, you mentioned Postgres. Yeah. Where does the database file live? In post in the in the container, or you specify it somewhere outside the container. Uh, that's a sto- storage layer, or yes, and that that's an interesting example. Databases, in particular, in containers, are somewhat of a debated topic in how you want to do it. A lot of what Docker focuses on outside of that is um, like a popular term is twelve factor apps, and so these are apps like state mostly stateless apps that run and talk to other distributed systems thinking like microservices style so you'd spin up something in a docker image it goes and talks to sqs and it talks to a database connection over here and it sends its logs either out standard out or to another like a log reception service somewhere and that's what makes it very like composable uh, runnable you get into things like container runtimes uh, and container orchestration systems like kubernetes or docker swarm Um, you can also do stateful systems and then by default Yes, the the database will be created in the container, um, but mm-hmm. Docker has a notion of data volumes, and so you can mm-hmm. have volumes that are basically like persistent containers that are just there to store data. You can also mm-hmm. mount um, directories from the host or pass through devices into the mm-hmm. container if you want to do it that okay. way. And that, that gets a little more nuanced, especially yeah. in the Docker world, because it really does no. focus on stateless apps more. No. That that sounds familiar to something that I'm doing. Um, I have a um, a jail which has a very small file system. There's only maybe six or seven files on it, but that is exported and mounted read only into another jail because the web server uses those files when it's composing a web page or some web pages, but it's generated in the back end. And the back end and the front end actually have no shared systems apart from from like that. So every 10 minutes or so, these files get regenerated and used in one of the statistics page. Say we have this many ports, there's this oh, many no. forbidden, there's this many. So it's generated in the back end um, based upon when a commit happens. So if there had been no commits to the FreeBSD ports tree, none of these statistics have changed. Therefore, we don't have to compute them. So once a commit comes in, it erases that file. Next person that needs to reference that file says, oh, this file doesn't exist. Let's generate the stats to populate that file. And there you've, you've got the latest stats. But it's generated in the back end. Um, what was the other thing you're talking about? Oh, uh, you're talking about uh, networking. And I was saying, ooh, how does my host redirect incoming uh HTTPS and HTTP requests to the jail, which is where right. Nginx is running. And I, I looked, and it, it's at the firewall level. Uh, the incoming request is redirected from the public INET uh, internet NIC, from the public NIC to the IP address of the jail. Ah, and okay. so it, it just goes straight into the jail, and the jail sees the request coming up, but the your web browser never sees it as going to a non writable address. Right. That all gets re- rewritten by the firewall. Yeah. And uh, I don't even know what IP address it is. It, it's all just abstracted away here in the okay. command that I'm looking at because it's using variables. It, it's, it's, I'm reading dollar sign fresh ports dub 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 jail. It gets redirected to there. And, <laughs> and that variable is defined somewhere higher up. I see. So, like one difference there, like uh, in in Docker, generally you, there's something called Docker proxy that runs on the host, mm-hmm. and that will then listen in the host namespace for any ports that you want, and then it handles forwarding those into into the Docker networking setup. Okay, all right. So it, it's listening for stuff on various ports, and you say listen l- listen for port 
80, for example, and redirect it to this container. Yes, exactly. Okay, so that's sort of at a different layer. On, on FreeBSD, the, the standard way to do that is with your firewall. In my case, that, that would be PF. Yeah. And, and it can, would, would be re- redirected that way. And you can definitely do that. And so if you were doing containers by hand, that's probably what you'd do where you'd, mm-hmm. uh, where you'd have to set that up yourself. Whereas Docker like, will automatically set up um, like a Docker bridged interface and then each Docker mm-hmm. container gets its own network namespace and gets a VETH pair that goes in the, in the container and then gets added to the bridge. And then you have a public, kind of like yeah. we're talking about with jails, where then you have a private network there and then Docker rather than do some, I mean, it does some IHP table stuff, but it also just runs this proxy and then forwards into that network. But you could do it all without that. And so that's where, like when Docker refactored into lib container in the back end, um, there's also this front end for it called run C. And it's basically yeah. like all the underlaying parts of Docker, but without all the helpers and REST API and all that stuff that sits in the, that's like the bulk of the Docker daemon. And then there's this little part that actually does the like syscalls to set up a container. And the rest is all just orchestration layers. So I think that's really where the value add or where people are excited about containers on Linux is that we have more, they've they've taken the abstractions and kind of packaged them up into APIs and workflows that people who aren't experts in syscalls and running systems can interface with. I can see the value there when you're, like going back to the original Google containers, which I was reviewing the PHK article uh, while you were talking, and I scrolled down to the bottom, and that post that we were reading from was actually prompted f- by Google announcing in something 2014 uh, of all their containers, like <laughs> 2 billion containers a day. Right. And, and I can see if you're deploying stuff on a regular basis, like you're ramping up. Like um, I, I think of, 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 of Tarsnap. Yeah. I'm sure that that backups do not occur on a flat curve. Um, If you were to look at all the data flowing into Tarsnap, it wouldn't be a flat curve. I'm sure that there's peaks and valleys and that he has to deploy additional resources to cater for that. And I'm sure it's all entirely automated to to meet demand. And I'm sure that 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 is also what happens at Google. Not, Not that they're deploying new servers, but when they go to roll out a new process or a new version of software, it's all highly automated because they're shoving it out into thousands and yes. thousands of servers. Yes. And, and so, I can see that if you're at that level of automation, yeah, you need that. But if you're not pushing out new stuff on an unatt- in an unatt- unattended environment, then you don't need it. But if you are, I can see the the definite advantage of it. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I I, I would agree with you. Uh, you know, Docker in particular works really well in those like highly dynamic, DevOps style automated cloud situations, um, where I've used things like LexD, and I think they don't they don't really get talked about in the same in the same way. A lot of people don't know about them, but for like for like your you kind of use cases where you you know maybe you have a more long running system and kind of you just want like a sub like a lightweight VM. That's definitely, I would say, it's like a lot more like jails. It usually runs, it has all the stuff to run, a, you know, a full init system and everything else in the container. You interact with it much like you would a running VM. And it, you know, it's more set up to have persistent state and all those yeah. sorts of things. Yeah. Whereas what Colin is doing with Tarsnap, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing Colin will correct us if, yeah, if we're right. wrong. Um, uh, he, he's running FreeBSD instances. And he's just spinning them up on AWS as required. And I'm I'm sure that there's a template there and yeah. it's all handled by AWS. He doesn't have to worry about it. I think he maintains which I'm sure, the FreeBSD AMI, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Oh. He does. He's certainly a neat dude, that's for sure. Yeah, well, he has a vested interest in having <laughs> the AMI working. That's the entire uh, Funny money maker works, there. Funny how running AWS. Yeah, well... All Everyone right. benefits. Well, we've certainly rambled a whole bunch about all kinds of things. Is there anything else you want to chat about before we move on with the show? Any questions, things I left unexplained or things you're left confused well, about? I, I was keeping a few few notes as I went along, but um, I started looking stuff up and then looking and I lost some of my notes. But 
if, if I forgot to note down what came to mind while I was looking up something else. So we'll we'll get back to that if I have anything else. We'll okay. bring it up in a fo- following show, but I don't think I do now. Excellent. Yeah. Well, hopefully this is um, for people who haven't played in the container space. Maybe this is a useful introduction. Please feel free to send us feedback on it or further questions or if you're con- confused about just what we're doing, how we're doing it, or why you might even want to do it at all, uh, let us know. Uh, we'll move on soon. But first, you probably want to start playing with some of these containers. Maybe maybe you want to get on... Dan really convinced you that jails are awesome. You want to go play with those. Or you're curious about, like, well, what is all this Docker nonsense? Either way, there's really, like, no better way to do it than heading over to our final sponsor this evening. And that... Uh, that is our friends over at DigitalOcean, and boy, are they good friends. What is DigitalOcean? Well, DigitalOcean is a cloud hosting provider. It's not like those ones I was talking about earlier in the show, right? The ones running OpenVZ. Nothing against OpenVZ. There's nothing wrong with it. But DigitalOcean runs on top of KVM. What's KVM? Oh, it's the Linux hypervisor. So DigitalOcean gives you real VMs running on that awesome KVM hypervisor. You can run whatever kernel you want. It's it's a full virtual machine running in the cloud in their awesome data centers. They've got them all over the world. They're opening new ones all the time. And you know what's fun about that? They call them droplets. They call them droplets. It's a ton of fun. And you can spin one up in just 55 seconds. They've got all the OSs you're probably going to want, including FreeBSD uh, and, and the latest Ubuntu, Container Linux, Fedora, pretty much anything that you're going to want on the, run the cloud. They've got it. Now, we've been talking a lot about, you know, primitives. You can run your own, you know, you can run KVM on whatever Linux distribution you want. You can run it at home. You can spin up your own virtual machines. But what you're not going to have is an incredible API and an even more incredible dashboard. That's where DigitalOcean really hits at home. They have competitors that have really confusing interfaces, that have way too many features, that have, you know, uh, you can just get stuck trying to configure features in there for days. Not so DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean makes it simple, clean, but you still have all the power to do what you need. And their incredible dashboard, it, it's all running on top of their API. So you know that anything you can do in the UI, you can make an API call to do. It's API first design. I really like it. The API is a pleasure to interact with. Their documentation is great. And there's a ton of community tools. And DigitalOcean is a big player in this space, right? So if you're using Terraform or Ansible or any of the popular systems, there's going to be a driver for DigitalOcean. You don't have to worry about it. Just spin that up. You can start playing with containers. If you use our promo code, Snap Ocean, one word, Snap Ocean, then you'll get a $10 credit. Prices start at just $5 a month. And since you're savvy, you know, you're a savvy TechSnap customer, you can just get that. Go go check out the $10 or the $5 a month rig because it's really pretty sweet. You might be like, oh, $5, uh, get a $10 credit. Just get started. That's two months for free after you sign up. You'll get a 5, 512 MB of memory, one virtual CPU, that's no slouch, 20 gigs of all SSD disk, and a whopping one terabyte of transfer. Also, just let me, in, let, you, let, you, you, let me let you in on just a little DigitalOcean secret here. That bandwidth, it's amazing. They really know what they're doing. It's incredible. They've got some of the best transit in the world. Go spin up that droplet. Go do some pseudo app get updates, package installs, whatever you need. You'll see it just blazing fast. They've got great peering, great transit, and they give you a really nice allotment of it. And, okay, so maybe you're worried, like, well, a $5 droplet, am I going to have to spin up more? Not if you're a savvy container user. Go spin up the $5 one. Maybe check out. They've also got hourly pricing. One thing you'll notice here, too, is that, like, the prices are right here on the page. You don't have to go find some third-party calculator service or dig deep in the documentation to try to figure out what your actual costs are going to be. No, it's straightforward. You use you set, select this one, you're going to be $10 a month or 1.5 cents an hour. Can you believe it? Maybe you want to splurge a little bit. Head on over to 3 cents an hour. Yeah, 3 cents an hour. There you'll get 2 gigs of memory, 2 virtual CPUs, and 40 gigabits of all SSD disk and three terabytes of transfer. Think about how many containers you can run on a system like that. Spin that up, go install Docker, go install FreeBSD, start playing with with jails, set it up. You can turn that into a whole bunch of hosts running all kinds of services. Run an IRC bouncer, run a mumble server, whatever you want. It's awesome. Run it just as a VPN client to, you know, to provide some more security while you're browsing the web from your phone. Any small project, small business idea in your next startup, run it on DigitalOcean. And they've got a ton of new features that you've come to expect from other competitors. DigitalOcean just doesn't better. So they've got they've got firewalls, cloud firewalls. You don't have to learn about IPFW. You don't have to learn about IT, IP tables. Cloud firewalls can help you configure that from their simple API, simple dashboard. 
They've got attachable block storage. So if you just want to, you know, you need a whole bunch more space for your awesome ZFS array, no problem. DigitalOcean's got that too. They've got monitoring and they've just announced object storage. It's called Spaces and true to DigitalOcean, it's super simple to get started with. It's $5 a month. You get a whopping amount of storage, a huge, I think it's 250 gigs of storage, uh, one terabyte of transfer, all for one or for all for $5 a month. Then you can just use their API. Maybe you need to post things there. You want to have backups kept up there. You want to serve static websites. You can you can play with all that stuff in Spaces. They're actively developing it. So go check it out. Go try it. Go play with it. Let us know what you think. Let them know what you think. They've been doing a number of great surveys. And go check out their community because they work really hard. They have real editors who take community contributions and turn them into some of the best documentations on the internet. While we were preparing for this episode, I found a bunch of great DigitalOcean articles explaining about containers, explaining how to get started with Docker on DigitalOcean, so you really can't go wrong. Go use our promo code SNAPOcean. That says thank you to DigitalOcean, and we mean it, for sponsoring the TechSnap program. Now it's time for feedback, our favorite segment in the show, where we get to hear from you our wonderful audience. First up, we're over at Twitter. Goran J writes, Hey, TechSnap Dan, can you share the laptop stand brand and model, please? It looks really neat. Oh, that's your old laptop on this image, though, isn't it, Dan? Yeah, that, that's my You've gotten uh, fancier. 2011, I think it's 2011 laptop uh, MacBook Pro. And uh, that's the one that I used to use when we were when we're doing the podcast um, and it would just sit in that laps, laptop stand, which, which is actually in a different position uh, now. Um, I've rearranged the desk slightly, but yeah, that, that la laptop stand, I forget what brand it is. Let me click on the link. Yeah, it's, I, I don't even think we see the manufacturer. It's just some universal thing. It's very beefy though. Um, it just attaches to their, your desk and then there's a double arm that that swings out and then you can tilt and and pan the tray that the laptop sits on so it's just basically what i liked about it is it had this little ledge at the bottom and it almost looks like uh what you would place sheet music on if you were um play, playing music in an orchestra it, it, oh, yeah. it just has this little lip at the bottom that the laptop will slide down on because at one time I actually had that thing almost vertical uh, sitting underneath uh, off in the corner. But now I, I have it pretty much horizontal and that just serves as a handle when I, when I grab the stand. Um, but yeah, I, I like it. it, it the, the price was amazing. It was uh, when, when I bought it, I'm not sure what it was, but right now it's 44 bucks. And um, I like it. it the, the neat thing that I, I saw is it comes with three Allen keys for the various joints that are on it. But then it also gives you a little uh, tool holder that attaches to the, la to, the, to the stand so that the Allen keys are always there. I just thought that was a nice touch. It's, it, it, they build it in as part of the cable guide. So, if you want if you want to get one of these, it, it's included in the link here, complete with my refer code. Thank you. Oh, and, uh, sneaky oh, yeah, well, Dan. Well, well, sorry, sorry. Um, I want to be upfront about that. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, you're an honest um, guy. But yeah, I, I've had it. Um, it does look really nice. I gotta a, say, a few months, a few months, and it's height adjustable, and the arm swings around. I think the total height is about two feet. Okay. So yeah. And it goes up and down with my that that was the thing. I, I thought about having it mounted to the wall, yeah. but that wouldn't work because I I'm on a desk that is a sit stand desk, and it'll go up and uh, down. Oh no, right, yeah, that's I couldn't. Work. I, it had oh. to attach to the desk. That makes sense. So it's all relative. Relative indeed. All right. Well, uh, hopefully people find that useful. Maybe we'll have some more converts to your magical stand before too long. But we can't stay still, not here on the TechSnap program. We got to move right along to our next piece of feedback today. So, Dan, why does Zpool Attach take three parameters? Yeah, I wondered that too. So I had to go and read the man page to figure out what he's talking about. And basically, it, it's so it's because a pool can have more than one device. 
And I actually went and had a look at one of my own Z pools and found that, yeah, it had two devices because I have a Z pool set up with um, six hard drives, but then I also attached um, a mirror of, of two SSDs is actually partitions on a couple of SSDs just as a as a log for this because it has the the zill basically it, it's the intent log of what it's about to do so basically it's like journaling it says okay this is what I'm going to do to the system okay now I'm going to go and modify the system and once I'm done I'm going to erase the intent log to say okay I've done that and what that allows you to do is write to the drives and if something happens you can come back up and say oh uh this is inconsistent oh this is what you're going to do oh okay well let's go and do that now and it, it's sort of like a transaction is what you can look at it like and that, that's why there is a second device on this but you can have multiple devices in a Zpool, and that's what the other device. That's what the third parameter is for. Is for the device name. That makes so generally, sense. So generally, you just say Zpool attached to this pool, this new device, which may not be the old device, but it's a new device that you're adding in. So yeah. So yeah. Okay. Well, that's very helpful. Thank you, Dan. You're welcome. Hopefully that answers all the questions we've got today. Uh, if that didn't, or you have follow-up questions or just new questions of your own, feedback about this or past episodes, it's pretty easy to send it to us. jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact. There you'll find a drop-down page. Just select TechSnap from the drop-down, type in your message, hit send, and you're done. There's also techsnap.reddit.com. And as you've just seen, you can find us both on Twitter. That's it for today's feedback. Please do send us some feedback. It's ever so lovely. And stay tuned. We'll be right back with the Roundup. And that brings us to the final segment of today's show. These stories weren't quite big enough to make it to the top of the show, but they're still oh so much fun. So that's why we call it the Roundup. First, roundup. First up in today's Roundup. What happens to the information you give to bike share companies? You know, there's been a couple new bike share companies around the Seattle metro area. Where there's like three different kinds, all sorts of colors. It's very, it's a very colorful scene with all these bikes around the streets. Uh, you got to sign up with an app. And I've been asking this question, like what, what happens? Yeah, uh, I started listening to this. And unfortunately, I thought it was ABC America, but no, it's ABC Australia, which is even more interesting because they're talking about um, what's going on in uh, um, in Australia because there are various new bike share companies coming in, especially a lot of foreign-owned uh, bike companies starting up these rideshare deals. And basically, you sign up, uh, give them credit card information, uh, and then you it gives you a list of where the bikes are. And the bikes are not necessarily at a central corral like you see a lot, a lot of places. They're just left somewhere. When you're done with them, you just leave them. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing that what you do with the app is you walk up to the bike and you say, okay, I'm going to share this one. And it un the app unlocks the bike for you. And then when you're done with it, you go back into the app and say, okay, I'm done with it. And then it locks the bike for you. I can see an attack vector there. Someone's riding along with a bike, and you say, okay, they're done with the bike, and it locks it while you're riding. Because it's a lock through the spokes. It's like fingers that come in through the spokes. Oh, yeah. But yep, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So they're just basically talking about problems that are hap happening with this. They're talking about bikes being left all over the place and just abandoned on, on street corners and stuff like that. And people are complaining. It's one thing to have a central corral, but when the bikes are, are just left around um yeah it's not good but the, the, they were i think the issue about what happens with this information is just a side thing i think that's the teaser that they've got to get you to listen to this when when really the biggest problem that, that they seem to talk about within the news article is the cultural effect of leaving having the bicycles just dropping them where, where you want them yeah, okay. That makes sense. 
All right. Well, so. that's somewhat interesting, and uh, I'm happy to see more bike shares. But yeah, it seems to be something we're trying to figure out as a society. So uh, more power to us, and maybe someday it'll work well. Mm-hmm. Okay. Next up, cover your assets. Yes. So is this some sort of tool? What What is this? Well, we're we're not going to dwell on this very long, but someone wrote in about this after we're talking about uh, re referencing a problem that I had with a DigitalOcean droplet where after I rebooted it, it didn't do what I want and how I fix it. So they said th this is a way to back up your whatever system it is. Um, and it just runs in the Bash shell, and it's easy backing back back up of core Linux uh, and any Unix system, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, Solaris, etc. And it is completely file system agnostic oh. and works on but is not limited to all these other things. So basically, you can easily automat automate and keep backups of the system itself, which he says offers great protection. I'm guessing it's he. I don't actually know who runs this. Um, but yeah, th there's nothing to, ins there's nothing I know about it that I can tell you apart from what I've read, read here. And if anyone's using it, let us know. It, it It's an interesting little thing, but I've not used it. Yeah, no, me either. I haven't, I had not heard of it, but uh, thank you I'll, to I'll, the person recommending it. I'll have to check yeah, it out. I'll, all you need is bash, sudo, and curl. I have those, so uh, that's great. Easy peasy. Standard command. It says standard commands like rsync. I don't know of any OS. rsync is standard on some operating systems? Hmm. I feel like I've had to install it, yeah. I mean, it's easy to get, so standard. Yeah, yeah. But it is standard, but I, yeah. I don't think it comes installed. I don't think so either. Someone will tell us if we're wrong, though. That's the beauty yes. of the TechSnap program. Yes. All tell right. us when we're wrong. Let's move right along to our dear friend, Mr. Krebs, on security. How to opt out of Equifax revealing your salary history. Yes, please. I would like to opt out. Yes. So what we do here is there's a whole lot of stuff that we can opt out to retain a little bit more of your privacy. Now, I actually take issue with having to opt out to not having my personal information bought and sold. I think I should have to opt into that. Thank you very much. I would, I would like something to be done about this. But basically, he goes through how you can opt out of that. And um, it's just basically a, um, the work number employment report is what it talks about. And you have to send your request via mail, snail mail, and do that. Or you can co contact us on the web. Um, now, it's not exactly clear what the potential consequences of freezing your file with the work number is, but he basically talks about that. And, yeah. Why companies can buy and sell this information, I don't know. It seems to be extremely personal. Yeah, it, it really does. And without, like you're saying, like you're not, you're not opting into it. You're not ever signing this form that says, like, yes, I know that I have to agree to this in order to qualify for such and such. It just all happens without you realizing it. Yeah. Basically, 70,000 approved entities in Equifax's verifier network with a permissible purpose can purchase his employment and income information for about 20 bucks. Wow. That's 70,000 approved entities. I and bet yeah, just not yet very we, hard to get And yet approved. we don't get to do that, right? Like, we have to go no. through this approval process. I can't just go be like, hey, mm -hmm. tell me about myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, anyway. Yeah, exactly. You're getting me all riled up, Dan. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, continuing in this uh, over here, we've got that some news over at IT Wire that the mm. CIA created code to impersonate Kaspersky Lab, at least according to WikiLeaks. Yeah. Now, some people will say, don't trust what we, Wiki Le Leaks is saying. It's not always necessarily true. And I don't know. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if the CIA did do this because it sounds entirely plausible to me. So maybe they were the ones behind the stealing of the information and the information coming up from the NSA about... Uh, Kaspersky Labs having this information is entirely not true. But then Kaspersky Labs g gave a plausible information, uh, a plausible explanation as to why they would have had that data. So why they'd be giving a plausible uh, explanation 
if they didn't do it. Yeah, I'm right? Con- that is kind of... Conv- yeah, if they didn't do it, then like, okay, well then, where's this plausible explanation coming from? Or do you just so, not know what your right hand is doing? Like, how does that work? Well, I admit, I haven't completely read the whole article. I haven't thought through it. Right. Well, that's so why it's in the round maybe, maybe the two things are not connected. There's only one maybe, way to find out. Maybe the impersonating the Kaspersky lab is not related at all to Kaspersky having top secret NSA documents. Right. Yeah. Very well true. Audience, you go find out, report back to us, and maybe we can all learn just a little bit more. Thank with, you. With that, we've got one more roundup item for you, and that's some some tips from our other dear friend, Mr. Troy Hunt. Locking down mm-hmm. your website scripts with CSP, mm-hmm. hashes, nonsense, mm-hmm. and report URI. I know what mm-hmm. some of those things are, but tell me more. I don't know what they all are either. Um, he he talks about a workshop that he runs, Hack Yourself First, in which piece, people responsible for building web apps try to get their try, get to try their hand in breaking them. And it turns out that breaking websites is heaps of fun. And basically, they start to cr- start to cover cross-site scripting and how to get around that and ha- how to use nonces. Uh, from what I remember, nonces are just one. A nonce is just a one-time value that you send in the request to the browser so that when you make your request back, like you're posting a form, it knows that it's not a form that came from from the website in the first place. It's just you have this local thing and you're shoving stuff at the website. So, yeah, um, if you've got a website, go through all this, make sure it works, and it it should help you make your website a little more secure against the bad guys. Yeah, he's got. Do you know more about this? No, not really. I haven't. I uh, I only just skimmed the article earlier, but uh, he's got some really good guides. The other one I saw from sometime last month, he had a the six step happy path to HTTPS, which is a really good in depth guide just about like yep. what you need to do, how do you get to HTTPS, taking into a lot of considerations. Like, yeah, it's really easy if you just like have one app and you just install Let's Encrypt certificate and you're done. But if you're running a whole business, there's like some yep. considerations. How do you do this? How do you roll it out smoothly? He's got a lot of pro tips there. So as always, thanks to Troy Hunt for his excellent blogging and researching. Uh, this looks like a good article too. And there's just mm-hmm. a lot of constructive advice. It's a great way to end the today's program, I think. It is. So as you may have guessed, it's now time for us to get out of here. That's it for today's show. We both have jails and containers to spin up, so there's no more time for TechSnap. But if you want to see more, there's a whole bunch more on jupiterbroadcasting.com. There you can find the archive of this show, The Past Incarnation, and a whole bunch of other great shows. Go check out the most recent Linux Unplugged. We did a crossover episode with Ask Noah. So if you like those shows, it's kind of a super show. Uh, I think there'll be a new user hour, user error out before too long. Or go just check out our good friends over at BSD Now. It's all great stuff. Uh, if you want to find more of us, techsnap.reddit.com. You can go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact. Uh, on jupiterbroadcasting.com, you can also find like the RSS feeds, other places to download all the stuff in the archive. You can see when we're here live. You can actually join and watch the live stream and join the IRC room and a ton of other great stuff. You can also find us both on Twitter. I'm at Wes Payne and he's at techsnap underscore Dan. Thank you very much for joining us for this week's episode, episode 345. Uh, Stay tuned, and we'll see you next week for 346.